today is, uh, as some of you know, is uh, Mexican's mothers, Mexican Mother's Day, and I'm blessed to be teaching on this day, especially with my mom being here and all, so for the first time hearing me uh, preach. So, But the assignment that I've been given today is 2 Timothy 1, 15 to 18. But before I read, I'm going to give you a quick overview. And the reason being is that I, I think it would be beneficial for, uh, for most of us to be reminded and understand the context of the portion of Scripture that I have been given the responsibility to preach. Um, so when Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, he was in prison. Or... To be more specific, he was in a hole in the ground. But even more so, Paul knew that he was close to death. He knew that death was imminent. If you go to 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time of departure has come near. While writing this epistle, he was looking down, as you can say, a, a barrel of a gun, any time ready to die for Christ. So let's talk a little bit about Timothy. Timothy, at this moment in his life, he was dealing with a lot of hardship. He was relatively young for his age as far as being a leader for in a church in Ephesus. Um, in 1 Timothy 4.12, he says, let no let no one look down on your youthfulness, but be an example to those who believe. Not only did he have external, external things going on in his life with people, but he also had internal things in his life where he was discouraged. He, had, uh, he wasn't as bold as, he was, as Paul wanted him to be. So in this epistle, in this letter, Paul... He's writing to him in a sense where he's trying to he's trying to motivate him. He's trying to encourage him. And we're going to see as we read from verses 1 all the way to 14 why what he's exactly trying to do. But as we read through the first 14 verses, keep in mind that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy. Notice what Paul wants to communicate and also what he doesn't mention. What I mean by that is sometimes what is not written in the scriptures is just as important as what is what is written. Very, very important when we when we read the word of God that we understand what is not there. Let's read verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. God here. Apostle Paul actually speaks of the sovereignty and the authority of the will of God. And now, by doing this, he even even though this is a letter of encouragement, and he tells he tells Timothy, "Hey, I'm an apostle." So he talks he talks to him about authority, and the reason why it's just the same way that you, as a parent, would talk to your son and tell him, "I am your father." Yes, I'm your friend and I love you, but I'm going to speak to you as a father speaks to a son. As a matter of fact, in verse 2, he says, To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from the God and Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Paul saw him as a son, not just a brother in the faith. Even in 1 Timothy 1, 2, he calls Timothy, My true child in the faith. Paul wants to let Timothy know that he is always on his mind. In verse 3, he says, He says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. The way my forefathers did, I constantly remember you in my prayers. What a great, I mean, can you imagine thinking about the Apostle Paul praying for you day and night that that to me i mean think about it. i mean just in a small sense if if uh you would say john macarthur was praying for you every day day and night but whoa what's he must love me or something, something's going on but this is this is 
But the, the, the greatest truth here is that we have Christ who intercedes for us every single day. He intercedes. The Bible says in Hebrews 7.25 that he lives for intercession for us. Romans 8.34, he is interceding for us. 1 John 2.1, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. Now, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one, one God, one mediator, also between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. There is no one else but, but Christ. Verse 4, I love what he writes here also because he says to, to Timothy that the reason he says, longing to see you. Now, when we understand that word longing, some of us, some of us in this room understand what that means because it's, it doesn't give it its due. You can't understand it until you understand. Remember, you've been in that pain where it hurts here and you want to see somebody and you can't eat and you can't think. This is what Paul was feeling. And he says, even as I recall your tears, this is the way they felt about each other. They loved each other. And he says, so that I may be filled with joy. He didn't say, I want to go see you so that I can teach you more things. He didn't say, so that I can disciple you even more. He said, I want to see you because I want to be filled with joy. That That is a great truth. That is an awesome... When you think about the Apostle Paul and the, what he writes here, we always think about the Apostle Paul and how he just... He is the man of doctrine. He is... You know, he killed Christians. But here he just tells them, you know what? I love you. One thing I want you to understand about this epistle is that... Is that this is, in a way, his, his last will and testament. I love the book of Romans. A lot of you do, too. But this, in a way, we have to pay attention because this is right before he, he dies. This is the last thing that we have that somebody writes. If somebody said to you, this is the last thing this person is going to write, you would pay attention to every single word. And this is what we have to do. And even we have, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to recap this, this chapter because we have to remember, we have to, and, and isn't that the way we learn? And when we're little, we we learn our, our, everything that we do by repetition. Verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. Here Paul is reminded of Timothy's genuine faith. That begs the question, is there such a thing as insincere faith? Yes, insincere faith could be also be known as hypocritical faith, deceitful faith, false faith. Back in 1 Timothy 1, 5, Paul writes that his goal of his instruction is to love from a pure heart. Good conscience and a sincere faith. Again, Paul writes about the sincere faith of Timothy's grandmother and Lois and his mother Eunice. And I only say, and the only thing I'm going to mention about this is that I can relate to this. I, I did have a grandmother, Lois, that Lois, not her, that's not her name, but her name was, um, well, I don't want to say it, it sounds weird, but in my life, and my mother, I had a mother, Eunice, that also prayed for me, that read the word, that when I, when I would walk in the house, I would see the Bible open. That I would, I knew that she would pray for me, even though I was in rebellion, and I would, I would not, I, I, I did not want to follow God. My mom was there, and she prayed for me. 
and she brought me to without a without question into a sincere faith and i just want to say thank you mama i love you you know what verse 5 doesn't say some of you know that timothy's father was an unbeliever right you guys remember uh, what willie said and that most likely he died maybe when he was very young. But you know what the Apostle Paul doesn't say? He doesn't say, I know your father was an unbeliever and you grew up without a father. Your father just messed you up. He does not say that. A lot of us start, get stuck in the past. What does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 5.17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Again, some of you are stuck in the past. And some of you are just, in a way, driving car in reverse. Yeah, you know, I'm driving in reverse in the parking lot. It's okay. I'm not going to crash. But some of you are in reverse in, in the freeway. And you, you just think, and in the worst, you think it's normal. Verse 6 is linked with verse 5. It says, For this reason I remind you to, to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. Paul is saying, because you have a sincere faith, he wants to remind you to kindle afresh or fan the flame the gift that God has in you. This is one of those scriptures where he says, you know what? You're not there. You weren't, you're not there where you used to be, Timothy. You need to fan the flame. Get back to where you were, Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul also writes to him and says, do not neglect the spiritual gift that is within you. He was already telling him from before. Don't neglect the spiritual gift that is within you. And he so that is what God today is telling you. Everyone in this room has a gift. If you are saved, God has given you a gift that you have to use. Timothy had a responsibility to, of using it, and so do you. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Remember, Timothy, you're not to be timid. That is not who you are in Christ. Do not be a coward. In Christ, we are not to be cowards. If you, if you are in that Boat, you need to get out of it. But what has he given us? He's given us power, dunamis or dynamite. That's the kind of power that he's given us, and we'll explain a little bit more later. But love, what kind of love? The love that that was used to that Christ died for you. That's the type of love. That is unconditional. The love that that casts that cast out fear. That is the type of love that he has given us. But not only that, he is giving us discipline or sound judgment, self-control. All of us need to exercise what he has given us. Now, has he's he's given us power, but some of you are not using it. As, as Christians, he's given it to you, but you, you don't use it. He's given us love, but we don't use it. Why? You're not responsible. You're not using the self-control, the discipline that God has given you. You are not using the resources that God has given you through his Holy Spirit. We say, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. 
Now that we know what God has given us, power, love, and discipline, and that we are not to be cowards, what are we going to do with that information? He says, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. I wonder, and then he says to him, not only in the, you're not supposed to be ashamed, but join with me in suffering. I don't know if most people would say, you know what, I'm supposed to, now, okay, I, I'm not ashamed. I'll tell people about God. But not only that, but you're supposed to suffer with me. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that one. I didn't sign up for that. Most people will say, oh, I, I think I can do that. I can talk about God. I, I'm, I'm bold enough to share Christ. But when it comes to it, will you sit there and be persecuted for Christ? Paul wanted to let Timothy know that he would suffer for Christ's sake. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a common thread through this epistle. He talks about it in, in chapter 2, verse 3, in 9, 10, chapter 3, 10 to 12, and 4, verse 5. He says, get the picture of Timothy. You're here to suffer. If you're going to live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. Now, he speaks about the power of God. What is this power of God? This power defines the power that God demonstrated in his greatness in salvation. It takes a lot to save some of you. Some of us. Some of me. <laughs> he said, look, he says, it is a great power it's great power. But what is he saving you from? Yes, he saves you from hell. He saves you from death. He saves you from Satan, from your sin. But ultimately, he saves you from his own wrath. Not only does he save us, but he calls us to be holy as he is holy. He says, who has saved us, this is verse 9, and called us to be with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted in us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Underline this, not according to our works. What is Ephesians 2, 8, 9? says, for by grace you have been saved, through faith and that of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. You are not, everybody in this room, as most, most people know, you are not saved by anything you've done. It is the gift of God. And you know, great, this, uh, this scripture is so awesome because it teaches uh, the doctrine of sovereign election and the, and the effectual calling. And I'm not going to get into that, uh, even though I would love to, but just to give you this doctrine, simply put, we're just going to read that verse again. Not only did he save us and called us to be holy, all right, so he called you to holiness, which had nothing to do with you, right? Not according to your works. What does Paul what does Paul tell Timothy? God did it for his own purpose and not whatever you think he saved you for. From when when did he do this? Did he do it when the day that you got saved, the day that you uh decided to raise your hand, the day you came up to the, you know, up front and pray somebody prayed for you no he said the day he did it was from all eternity he did it long before you were ever you ever existed he had you in his mind do you see the great the great truth Philippians 1 6 but not only does God choose his children from all eternity but you can rest assured that God 
that began a good work will bring it to completion, completion or perfection at the day of Christ Jesus. So not only does God save you from all eternity past, but he's also going to hold you to the day. The day that you die, he, you, will be, you will be in heaven with him. Imagine, imagine if, if uh, the truth was that God saved you from all eternity, and then one day you could say, oh, but I could still lose my salvation. That's not the God that I serve. That's not the God of the Bible. That would be a horrible truth. Why would I want to... Why, that would, I would always be thinking about what I need to do right. I would think about all the works that I have to be doing. But God is able to hold you and he's able to keep you in his hand and bring it, as the Bible says, to perfection to the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 10, But now he ha has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus and abolished death and brought life and immortality to, to light through the gospel. So Paul lets us know that what was a reality to God from eternity past now has been revealed in time and space through Jesus Christ, through the gospel. Very simple. So what he did in eternity, we see now in Christ, and now we see our salvation, and one day we will see our glorification. Verse 11, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. The word which goes back to the word, goes back to the, the word gospel, the good news. Appointed means set in place. Set in a place by who? God himself. So what, what, he was appointed first as a what? As a preacher or a pro proclaimer, a herald. That word was used in a, and I know that most of you know this, the, the guy that speaks about this all the time is Steve Lawson, but some of you that don't, it's used. it was used, um, in, you could say, in a worldly sense, secularly, as a messenger for a king, or and, and to hear the herald proclaim the message was equivalent to having heard the king himself. To defy the message was to defy the king himself. The one delivering the message had no power to alter the message and was responsible, responsible for the clarity and the purity from which the message was conveyed. If the king felt he did not do his task correctly, his life would be in danger and he, he had the right to kill him. And so it is with a lot of us uh, that decide to come up to the pulpit. If we do not preach the gospel, we do not preach what we are told to do, um, it is a very dangerous thing to be up here. Apostle Paul speaks of, of his authority when it says apostle. Paul, says, Paul is not only sent to preach the gospel, but sent by authority. Whose authority? Christ's authority. There are some that to this day call themselves apostles. But just as there are qualifications to be an elder, there are also qualifications to be an apostle. And I'll just give you one. You must have seen the risen Christ. You cannot be an apostle if you have not seen the risen Christ. See Acts 1, 21 and 22. Then he says, as a preacher proclaims, then he says, a teacher explains. Yes, in that order. Some of us, instead of being preachers of the gospel, you guys become explainers of the gospel. I don't want to hear explainers of the gospel. People don't get saved by explaining the gospel. They don't care about the gospel. You need to proclaim the gospel. You need to say it the way the Bible is intended to say it, with, with authority. 
That is the way we are supposed to preach. And that's the reason why Timothy is in this mess because he wasn't bold enough. And yet, how, much, how many of us would love to be Timothy, but yet the Apostle Paul here tells him, you know what, you are not where you need to be. Proclaim, then explain. Verse 12, For this reason I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. It says, For this reason, for what reason? For the gospel resulting in Paul's divine appointment. Suffer what? What exactly did he suffer? Paul, if you don't know anything about Paul's life, if you don't understand what he suffered, you can just go to 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. I'll read it for you guys. Or you can go there if you want. As the servants of Christ, I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten f times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was spent in the deep. I have been on frequent, frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. I mean, after all these things that he says, he says, I also have the pressure of thinking about my church. But you know what he says? But even after all that, he says, I am not ashamed. And he says, why? Because I know whom I believed. He doesn't say, again, remember, it's not about, it's sometimes, it's, you have you got to make sure that you understand that he doesn't say what I believe, because some of you think you're saved because you of what you believe. You're not saved from what you believe. You're saved because of whom you have believed. And then he says, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He's entrusted what? He's entrusted his whole life, everything that he has, he's entrusted to Christ. But when, to the, what day did, is he going to entrust him? To what day? Read 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4, 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to the, all, all those who have loved his appearing. So what's the day? The crown of righteousness, the day of reward, the day that you will die, and the day that you will see Christ, and he will see, and you will receive your reward. Not for anything, let's say, not because you reward for being saved, or like I said, like we spoke about, it's not about being doing anything good, and that's why you're saved. It's you are Get this. I want you guys to understand this. Even though we are not saved by works, your works tell you that you are saved. Understand that. A lot of people don't understand that basic principle. 
Your words don't save you, but your works tell us that you are saved. Verse 13. Re retain the standard of sound word, words which you have heard from me. In faith, love, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, retain or hold fast or keep, keep the standard or example. So I mean, hold fast the example of, what, of the sound words. Sound words, yes, the teaching and doctrine. So yes, doctrine does matter. Hold fast to it. Keep it. And what he say? He says the truth that has been heard from Paul in the faith and love reminds us that it's not only important that we protect the truth, but it's how we pr protect it. He says, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. We've spoken about this many times. It's, we, 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 most of us, uh, I believe, are saved in this room, but the fact of the matter is, even if we are saved, it's not about, and I speak about me, it's not just that you know the truth, but you have to know how to speak the truth. And that is, uh, that is also a very important truth that we have to make, that we keep in mind. And some of us, you know, and I'm not just talking about the people that speak without boldness or even, the, I'm talking about even the people that don't speak. And are quiet about their faith. Because when you say, when we talk about that love again, you have to speak with boldness. Because if you have your neighbor, if you know somebody that is not saved, then you must, you must share the gospel with them. Verse 14, guard the Holy Spirit, no, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to to you. Guard here is, is a military word. Okay, so how are we to guard this treasure? The treasure being the gospel and its teaching. He says, through the Holy Spirit. Here we, taught, we, we are being taught the synergistic sanctification, the divine sovereignty of God and human responsibility. We need to know that we can't just sit back and say, God, you take care of it. Or in other words, some people say, you need, to let, you need to let go and let God. That is not sanctification. We don't just sit back and relax and let God do the work. We need to guard. We need to we need to fight the good fight. Now we come to a portion of the scripture that I was actually assigned, but I want you to, to just briefly understand these uh, 14 verses. But let's read verse 15 to 18. It says, You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. I want to um, focus on three points or that if you guys want to write these down. Number one, the people addressed. Number two, the perseverance observed. And number three, the petition desired. Now, again, the people addressed, the perseverance observed, and petition desired. Point one, the people addressed. Why did Paul go from 
from verse 1 to verse 5 to motivating him, letting him that he loves him, he prays for him, prays, he prays day and night. He says to him that, that, you know, he has a sincere faith. He tells him that, uh, you know, I long to see you. I mean, that's a great motivation. I mean, if I can hear one. So that I may be filled with joy. I mean, that's, I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? Why does he go from that? And then it goes from 6 to 14 where he says he's sharing great doctrinal truth. And because of those truths, commanding him to, to act accordingly, right? And then he goes from there and tells Timothy about those from Asia, specifically Phygelus and Hermogenes, and then Onesiphorus. Paul knew that, well, again, Paul knew what was going on in the heart of Timothy. Again, Paul, uh, Timothy was in a place where he was not encouraged. He was, he was being discouraged. A lot of things were going on, and, um, and he was very... I don't believe that Paul ever thought that Timothy was going to fall away. But at the same time, I, he knew that he needed to be there for him. Paul then gives Timothy a negative example and a positive one. And, and the reason being, I believe, is because he tells him, look, after all of this, after what I just told you, you have a negative example in Phygelus and in Hermogenes, and you have a positive one in Onesiphorus. And he says to him, in, in a way, who do you want to be like? Who are you going to be? And I think for the most part, He's speaking about one also one word that that is in chapter one that is very powerful as far as being uh, Christians, and I, I already said that word a couple times, and that's being unashamed, and that's what he does not want from from Timothy. You cannot be unashamed. And in verse eight, he says to he says. He says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. And then in verse 12, he says, but I am not ashamed, talking about himself, Paul. And then in verse, in verse uh, what is it, 16, he says, he was not ashamed, talking about Onesiphorus. So in a, in a sense, the key word here is unashamed. That verse, anytime I, I see that verse or that word unashamed, and, and if it doesn't for you, it should. It reminds me of uh, Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto, unto salvation. Jesus said in Luke 9, 26, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. Phygelus and Hermogenes did not want to suffer. They were deserters. He said, Apostle Paul tells him in verse 15, that not only Asia... He says all of Asia, but obviously not. It's it's a it's a, it's a provident a province in in the in in the Middle East turned away from me. He took it personal. He didn't say they turned away from Christ, but he did take it personal. And Paul says, "Follow me as I follow Christ." I can't tell you if these people including Phygelus and Hermogenes, whether they were going to be saved or not. But all I know is that they were deserters. You don't want to be in that camp. 
when the Apostle Paul calls you out because you deserted him. Paul was an enemy of the state. And again, Phygelus and, and Hermogenes, they didn't understand what 2 Timothy 3.12, if you desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. These two men feared men. Anasiphorus feared God. Phygelus and Hermogenes' service unto the Lord was like a job to him, to them. Anasiphorus, his service unto the Lord was joy. They, I, Anasiphorus understood what First Thessalonians said in five sixteen. It says, "Rejoice when sometimes, no, always." Second point, persever perseverance of observed. Only one person in this, in, in the, uh, of these three people actually persevered. Yeah, I, like I said, it's true that we don't know if they were saved or later were going to be saved. I don't know. The scriptures are not clear about that. But I can tell you this, that if you find yourself living in sin... And you, if somebody calls you a deserter and you're not living a godly life, I would suggest you don't call yourself a Christian. To say the least, you make the Lord Christ, you trample on the cross and you just make him look horrible. Verse 9 says that he has called us to a holy calling. We know that the in 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 if you let's read 2 Timothy 3 5. Holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. These are the guys, that, these two men, avoid them. These Phygelius and, and Hermogenes care, don't have anything to do with these men. Some of you love to hang out with unbelievers because they're more fun or they, they might just, they bring more joy to your life. But they will send you to hell And that is what you need to remember. These two men were not, if in Hebrews 11 there's the hall of faith, you could say these men were in also the hall of shame. They were not. They were, if we as Christians are, are to be unashamed, these, people, these two men were, they had shame. And Asiphorus knew what Philippians 2.12 said. We need to walk Work out our own salvation. Again, we're not saved by works, but your works tells us that you're saved. The last point, the petition desired. I want you to see what Paul petitions or what he asks for. And what he doesn't say. You know, I mean, he, Onesiphorus did all these great things for him, right? He looked for him. It wasn't easy to find Paul. He was stuck in a hole. But he found him. He refreshed him. But what does he say about Onesiphorus? He, what is the petition he says? He says to him that he wants the, the, to grant him mercy. He doesn't say to, he doesn't say, you know what, God, please give him what he is due. Give him his just reward. 
for what he has done for me. He doesn't say that. Why does he say, you know, a lot of a lot of people, one of the biggest questions when people come to the, even as non-believers, but when you first come to the Lord, one of the biggest questions people have is, why does a good and powerful God allow evil to happen to me or to us or to anybody? But when you understand the, the wretched creature that you are, compared to the holiness of God, the real question you should be asking, why does, he, why does God ever allow any good to happen to you? That is the question that us, we have to answer. And you know the answer is, we, there's no reason. We, we don't deserve any of his goodness, his mercy, his grace. And if you understand that, then you are, you are moving up. But if you continue to think that you deserve something, you might not even be saved. Again, the more we the more we see who we truly are in the light of Scripture, and the more we get to know God personally, two things will happen. Two things can happen. Either you will run from God because you can't stand how holy He is. You can't stand how righteous He is. You've been around the the in a sense, the goody two shoes guys. They go, man, I don't want to hang out with that guy. I don't want to be around that guy. I mean, he just always makes me look bad. Imagine if you understand who you are, and then you see God, and you say, man, I don't, I don't want to be around these. I'm horrible compared to that. And you don't want to be there. Or you will hold to him as tight as you can, even though you will hold to him. Knowing that, still he will never leave you nor forsake you. Imagine that. You knowing that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You're still holding on to him because that's all you can do. Because you're not going to run away. Because you can't. Because once you are a child of God, you have to hold on to him because there's no other way. There's no other place you can go. Some people say that Christianity is a crutch. But for the week, I've heard it said many times. That family members, everybody said, you know what? Christianity is for people that are weak. Weak in the mind, weak in the heart. They need that. Go, cool. it's good for them. But I say to you, and, I've, and I know how it feels, it's not a crutch, it's a gurney. I've been in a gurney. You know how it feels? You feel humbled. You feel terrible that everybody's looking at you, man. And you're like, oh, man, it's a terrible thing to be on there. But you know what? You have no choice. And you have to go get better. So after all that, what is the Apostle Paul, what is his counsel? What is he, after all these things that he says to, to Timothy, what is the counsel that he tells Timothy? He says, be strong. Oh, that's not a good counsel. How can you, what are you talking about? I don't want to hear that. How is that? What is that a good counsel? Uh, imagine you, uh, you know, a lot of people have been going through difficulties. Everybody here, the older you get, the tougher life gets. The life, oh, that's how you say that. It gets tougher, right? I tell my kids all the time, <laughs> life is going to get tough. You better get ready. But what happens if I say to people that, hey, just be strong. That's not good enough, right? But this is what the Apostle Paul says. But he says to him, this is in, in the next actual chapter, in the next chapter in verse 2, says you, the word you is, is in the Greek, it's like looking in your face, it's like looking in your eyes. You, you need to be strong. You know how people talk like that? You need to be strong because that's the way we need to talk to each other. And he says, be strong in the grace. 
So how does God impart strength? He does it through grace. You need to understand understand the grace of God. That's the only way you're going to be strong. And what is the source of grace? He says, in Christ Jesus. That is the only way that the Apostle Paul is going to be, the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy. After all of that, you need to be strong. You need to make sure that you hold fast. There is no other way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful word, God, that you've given to us. Your holy scriptures are amazing, Lord. And you have given it to us for a reason, for a purpose. Lord, I pray for everybody in this room, God. I pray that they would understand if where they stand with you, Lord. Some of us are not where, they, where we need to be. Some of us are, are like Paul. Some of us are Timothys. Some of us are Anisiphorus. Some of us will even be Phygelus and Hermogenes, Father. And I pray that we be those that hold fast to the faith. Speak to us tonight, Lord, and continue to do work through, during this whole week, Father. And may we be in your scriptures and may we be filled with your spirit, God, and we take advantage of what you've already given to us, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.